Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jonathan Bricker, and I'm the chairman for the Arkansas District Export Council. And I want to welcome you all to Assessing and Reducing Your Supply Chain Risk, featuring Mr. Glenn Walensky. Thank you again for uh, being here with us today. I want to begin by thanking our sponsors. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have the sponsors of the Arkansas Economic Development Commission and Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions. Without their support, we would not be able to spend our time helping to educate the exporting community. Um, so we are truly grateful and they are such a, an amazing resource and strategic partner for the District Export Council. For those of you that aren't quite sure who the District Export Council is and what we do, allow me to do a quick introduction. We are a private nonprofit organization that brings together experienced international, international business people with potential exporters. Each DEC member has been appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce for their real world international expertise. We have a ton of experience within our council uh, throughout many different sectors. So having said that, that doesn't mean that we have all the answers to every question, but we can introduce you to someone that does. So basically we are a community of connections within the exporting world. My hope for everyone today is that you walk away from this webinar with a little bit more confidence in your exporting abilities. And if you have any questions at the end of the webinar and you don't feel comfortable asking it here, I invite you to reach out to us on our website at exportarkansas.org and we'll have one of our members reach out to you directly. Basically, we wanna be your strategic partner to help you grow your exports which helps grow your bottom line. I also want to bring to your attention and invite your company to apply for the 13th Annual Governor's Award for Excellence in Global Trade. We'll be hosting this event on Friday, October 6th. Uh, the Gala Awards dinner starts with a networking reception for the Arkansas business community, and it's going to be located at the Doubletree Hotel in downtown Little Rock. This award recognizes the export success and excellent quality among Arkansas's manufacturing and agricultural companies that are actively trading in international markets. We'll present each winning company with a trophy and a certificate during the award ceremony. Then the companies will be profiled throughout the year as the winners of the governor's award on the RDEC website and throughout social media. All right. I know that was a long intro. Before we begin though, I'd like to ask everyone to keep themselves muted and raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. That way we don't have any background noise interrupting our speakers. So I, I appreciate everyone's attention to uh, help with that. Okay, I'd like to introduce you to your moderator for this afternoon, Mr. Rudy Ortiz. Rudy has recently retired from the Arkansas Economic Development Commission and is the previous chairman of the DEC. Today, he is the owner of Strategic Business Services, LLC, where he helps companies in a wide variety of international business and exporting needs. Rudy is also a partner with Cross Border Business Consultants, which is a global team of international business consultants working together to assist companies to initiate business in other countries. For this reason, he's the DEX Education Chair. Rudy. Thank you so much for putting this all together and spearheading it. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I appreciate that. So if we could go to the next slide, Ms. Heidi. So as it turns out, uh, our, our guest speaker is Glenn Walensky, and he's the Senior VP of Customer Success at Resilink. Uh, this is a really a world-class company that is really uh, the, the number one company uh, in the space of you know monitoring supply chains and helping clients with, with their supply chain issues. Uh, and we're very, very happy to have Glenn be our, our uh, uh, one of our panelists today. And, uh, you know, obviously he has a lot of experience uh, in corporate America and, and has been a real asset to, to Resilink. I've been um, proud to, to be able to 
uh, work with this company now for I think like the last three years uh, where they've helped us really kind of get a handle on what's going on worldwide in in terms of supply chain supply chain issues and so uh with that glenn uh i will let you uh take it over all right thank you and uh thank you everyone uh for joining rudy thank you and jonathan heidi uh this is going to be you know an interactive session hopefully a little bit um rudy and i are going to talk through um some information and but you know, feel free if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll be glad to, uh, you know, Heidi, I think you're going to moderate that piece and uh, we'll take those questions. So yeah. let's start. Right. And you can go ahead and if you wish, put your question in the chat. If you want to do that, that's fine. And uh, Heidi and I will monitor the, the chat as well. And uh, we'll ask uh, Glenn uh, questions or I will answer questions as, as uh, appropriate. Thank you so much. All right. So, you know, if we look at the agenda when it was sent out, I think the first thing we want to talk about is the the current state. Um, and the current state for us, we you know got reports out through the uh, basically the end of the the first half of 2023. And it's interesting to look at what's been going on. I don't if you the number one event type I think is uh, factory fire, as you can see. But we saw a year over year decrease, even though it's still the number one event type, the decrease of almost 20%. And why is that significant? If you if, if I go back to uh, 2020 and look at the disruptions, factory fires were still a thing, um, but they weren't nearly as high up on the list. And we saw COVID, at least from what our estimation is, COVID caused a lot of this. Um, you had less cleaning of the facilities. You had uh, people uh, not worrying about paper and things like that being around. Chemical coatings on ceilings weren't being cleaned as often. And so we had factory fires. Now it's taken several years for them to start dropping. Uh, last year, we had another record number. So seeing it drop a little bit this year is, is good. Um, I think Rudy, you, you called me a little earlier saying, you know, one of the ones that you see in the top 10, you were wondering if it was right is fines. Fines. And, you know, uh -huh. Yeah. If you look, fines are the, the number is low, but the fact that it's up a hundred percent, or you know, over a hundred percent just in uh the year over year, I think that's gonna play into some of the later slides we're gonna talk about and the reasons. Um, you know, what's going on? Why are why are um, why is fines causing a disruption? What are the other disruptions? Now, this is worldwide data. So um, we're monitoring, you know, sources all over the world for this data. And you can sort of look at it and say, okay, what's going on today in the world? And why are some of these things happening? And I, and I you know, the factory fires, we kind of understood. Oh. The economic situation, see? you know, we see. Uh, somebody's got their mic on. Uh, Patrick. Uh, some people have their mics on. If if you would turn off your turn off your mic, would really appreciate. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, my, my apologies, Glenn. Go no. Okay. Go ahead, Glenn. All right. No problem. Yeah. I mean, Rudy, from looking at the data yourself, I mean. What kind of questions do you have about this data? Or what kind of insights did you see? Because I think it's yeah, good you know, to hear from others. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that is uh, uh, interesting here, I mean, first of all, let me tell you that we're going to present lots and lots and lots of information. Okay. Uh, you know, don't bother taking notes. We're going to send everyone the slide deck uh, so that you can utilize. You know, I, I, I want you to kind of pay attention to you know what's being covered because you know one of the chief issues and one of the things that we're trying to resolve here is you know you've heard the saying you know you don't know what you don't know and i think that you'll find that as you look at this data you you're going to say wow i i was not aware that that was going on uh, that that was an issue maybe i should be paying attention to to that issue because i didn't know that it was such a such a significant issue and so you know once again uh I, I think that's what you're going to find here is that you're going to discover that there are things that were not on your radar 
hopefully they will be after this webinar and and, uh, and also understand that we're going to send you the entire uh, uh, slide deck so that you can take notes later on and uh, and go over it as a as a resource to you but you know once again i, I think the the part that uh, is um, uh, interesting to me is the the part about uh, you know the factory fires uh, going going down now you know i know for the longest time uh, factory fires were a, a really a significant issue and and something that most people uh, were not aware of you know all of a sudden they couldn't get their stuff and and they come to find out that their factory that they get their parts from that that manufacture the parts uh burned down or even just a a distributor uh they they would burn down and uh, all of a sudden you couldn't get your parts and and while it has gone down a little bit that could be one of two things first of all it could just be an anomaly but it, it could also be that people are paying more attention that the insurance companies are forcing their their insurance their insured clients to implement systems uh to to make sure that they mitigate the insurance company's risk right uh and so i i think that's uh that's one of the things that i kind of read uh, out of this data yeah it's interesting one of the things that we've seen is you know, we all ask our suppliers for their business continuity plans, or we should be asking them, you know, what are they going to do if there's a disruption? And I think a lot of times what we saw was suppliers had business continuity plans, but they've never tested them, right? They, they were plans that look good on paper, but never tested. And then when the disruption happened, we saw that. We saw that, you know, these disruptions over the last couple of years, you know, COVID sparked it. But the disruptions caused a lot more uh, downtime than were planned because of that. So I think you know you start seeing these disruptions. I, I do think one of the interesting ones is we all heard about the port disruptions. Yeah, you know, we've all been talking about you know the, the Long Beach uh, trying to get goods into Long Beach. There were hundreds of ships backed up, and then once they got in there, nobody picked up the containers. There weren't drivers. That's starting to slow down. We don't even see that in the top 10 for Q2, which is a good sign for everyone that at least, you know, if something gets here, we can get it. So this is, um, you know, a, a comparison, kind of looking at, you know, uh, Q1 of uh, 2023 versus Q2, just to give you the number so you can see the differences. Um, you can see factory fires is up over Q1, you know, Q2, but it's down year over year. But it's still um, back in, you know, if you look at the number, that's, uh, what, 1,600 roughly factory fires already in the first half of the year. While the number has gone down, uh, in uh, 2019, the number was less than 800 for the year. So it is significantly up in the last uh, four years. Yeah, and and, then, and to and to your point, Glenn, it could be a number of things. It could be that people have companies have less employees, uh, they have less maintenance, they have less of everything, and are are really not paying attention to the things that could set the the place on fire. Yeah, and then I think one of the interesting ones here is that very last one on the chart: legal action. Um, we're seeing more and more legal action. I'm not sure if you're seeing it uh, in the Arkansas area, you know, or where the constituents are, but we're seeing a lot more of that due to the ESG and the PFAS, which is polyfluorinated substances, right? So we've all, you may have heard that in the news. There's a lot of things going on with PFAS, and it is a material that is used to basically coat all sorts of um, all sorts of things that we buy. Yep. Um, you know, it's interesting. We we had a big PPE shortage uh, during COVID and everybody was trying to get, you know, the hazmat suits and face masks and all that. They're all coated with, with PFAS. That's what makes them water repellent and, and able to, you know, work so well. And we're actually now realizing that you know, we've got to do something different. And so there's a lot of legislation that's starting to happen around PFAS. Um, and, you know, people are starting to say, okay, what can we do uh, to get this out of our supply chain? 
And it, it's probably, you know, going to be something that's going to have to be, you know, there, there's a lot of natural things and non-natural things that have to happen uh, to do this. I'm not sure if, you, if anyone here is seeing issues with that, but it is something we're seeing a lot of. We're seeing the legal fines. That's that fines that we're talking about are for using things like PFAS and ESG. So, you know, what do we have to do is basically, you got to know if it's in your supply chain, right? Um, you hey, can, uh, my, yeah. My apologies, uh, Glenn. Uh, 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 Chris Leggett asked actually a, a, a pretty interesting question in terms of the fire specifically. Uh, yeah. is, is this data only like in the US or is it like worldwide? Worldwide. Okay. We're, we're, we monitor um, over 200 countries. Yep. So that's not a problem that we have just in the United States. It's everywhere. In fact, in other places, it may be even worse because the infrastructure is not nearly as good. Yeah. Oh, and the, yeah. And, and generally what you'll find in some of the others is it where you might have a factory fire sometimes in the U.S. that takes out a portion of a production set. Um, a lot of times in other areas, if it's not as a developed country, it takes out the entire, you know, the entire factory. All right. Uh, back to PFAS a little bit, I, you know, there are alternative materials and things that can be used. I do think you're going to see more and more of this because the legislation is happening. We're starting to see that, you know, a lot of governments are outlawing it. The U.S. has, um, the U.S. government is looking at how they get PFAS out of anything that they're buying. Um, so it's going to become something that is going to be looked at very heavily in the next year or so yeah and it may very well be that your the clients your, your clients uh, uh to the audience out there as people become uh, more and more aware of some of the dangers of the pfos that they're going to want you to remove it from the products that you're selling to them and so that's a risk right that's a that's a, a yeah. business risk if you don't do that so that's something that you may want to pay attention to yeah, and, and it, you know, it, it's going to require, you know, understanding your supply chain, who you're buying from and who they're buying from, you know, looking at that uh, bill of materials to understand, you know, where it is. Another critical issue, I think we all hear about China and Taiwan, but um, I mean, if you, there's a lot of data here. I think one of the biggest things is, is you probably know the U.S. Chips and Science Act is 57 or 52.7 billion dollars that it, you know the Chips Act is going to invest uh, for semiconductor here in the U.S. So there's a lot of our customers who are uh, taking advantage of that. Uh, so there's a lot of companies that are looking at that. It's a you know, it's a large number. Um, it's not easy, obviously, to move chip manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, but it is being done. Um, but you know, if you think about the amount that has been done in Taiwan, right? Uh, there's so much of that manufacturing was there that if something happened in Taiwan and that was disrupted, it would be significant. So, and as you can see at the bottom, it takes five years to build a uh, front end site. So it's not something that can be, you know, done immediately. So it's key. Um, a lot of our companies in the semiconductor space, what they're doing is obviously looking at how we move either nearshore, onshore, or at least uh, find other alternatives to uh, China and Taiwan. Yeah. And, and I think uh, another takeaway is that not just in terms of China and Taiwan, but just in general, you know, the, the world is constantly changing. The dynamics, the geopolitical dynamics are constantly changing. Uh, and so you've got to pay attention to your supply chains and, uh, you know, whenever it's possible, uh, doing some reshoring and some nearshoring is going to be very useful of uh, having a kind of a combination of those two things. You don't want to have all your supplies, even in one country, uh, because if something happens in that country, like 
you know, Taiwan, well, then you're, then you're toast. And so it's really uh, best to have multiple suppliers uh, in different countries if, if it's possible at all. And, and strictly as an example, you, you might have 50% of your supplies in one country, 25% in another, and 25% in another. Uh, that way, if something happens in any one of those countries, you can just call the other ones, your other suppliers, and ask them to increase their output. You already know that they can, in fact, produce your product because they already are. And it's just a matter of ramping up the productions. And so looking at those kind of strategies uh, in order to mitigate your, your down risk is really, really important. And this one, you and I were kind of talking about, Rudy, the other day, and it goes to your point about uh, ever-changing, uh, you know, rules and ever-changing uh, economies is things like commodities. You know, who would have thought the state of Myanmar, you know, nobody's thought of them as a economic powerhouse. They are shutting down 10, Right. The intent is expected to be impacted because they're going. The WA state's going to suspend all mining activities. Yeah, right. and you know, and Glenn, and, and you probably know this, but tin is one of the one of the metals that is used extensively yeah. to try to anodize and to uh, create uh, uh, different kinds of steel alloys. It's used in a lot in steel alloys, uh, so it's an incredibly uh, important commodity. Yeah, and, and so what you have, you know, one of the speculations obviously is, look, they realize they've got a valuable commodity now. And what, you know, they can put pressure on the world to raise prices, to, you know, do different things. So you see that there, um, you got cobalt in China, right? We're supposed to, now the interesting thing, you're supposed to hit a surplus next year, which would be great for some people and bad for others, right? It's great for the buyer, not good for the seller. Um, and that's in the Congo. But what do we have in Congo? Forced labor. And there are a lot of forced labor acts out there, right? So we've got the, you know, the Uyghur Act here, or UFLPA, you know, the Forced Labor Protection Act. You've got that in other countries too. And so all of these things add up. I know it sounds like all doom and gloom, but it's not. Um, but there are things going on. Here's another one. Uh, Nam Namibia banned the export of all unprocessed Libyan, lithium, right, as of June 8. So cobalt, manganese, graphite, nickel, and other rare earth elements. Well, wow, that's a huge, you know, thing for the EV market. And we all, you know, we all hear about it. You know, everybody is looking. I'm not sure how many people here have electric cars, but, you know, we have lithium batteries, though, in everything, in our laptops, in our razor blades, in our, you know, can openers, everything today has lithium ion batteries. Um, and so this can have a huge effect. So they're, they're flexing their muscle on their economic status. And we see more of that happening. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Glenn, uh, I think the thing that people are not aware of that in terms of uh, electric vehicles, that's an that's an item that's a you know a product that is actually at a much higher risk in terms of supply chain uh, chain related issues than conventional you know gas cars uh, because there are uh, it counts on so many different uh, somewhat rare uh, you know products like cobalt and manganese and things like that that uh, there is a, a much smaller amount of those kinds of commodity materials than there is of you know steel so you know very very sensitive to uh to fluctuations in uh in uh quantities and pricing of of those commodities yeah it, it, it's interesting because when you look at you, know, you mentioned you know evs it's not just evs too the entire auto industry um, we've got a lot of those customers and we, we've mapped down, you know, five tier D, uh, you know, into their supply chain for them. And they realize that they're not car companies anymore. They're actually electronics companies. Because once you get past that first layer, you're dealing with electronics companies, the yep. same ones that all the high tech companies have been using for years. You know, the ST micros, microns, all those, that's who's down in their supply chain now. So, 
you know, when we had the chip shortage, that's why the cars were, I mean, there were, there's numerous stories of cars and trucks, Pen, Penske trucks and Ford and others who had cars that were sitting there without computer chips. They couldn't do anything with them. They had to sit on their lots. Until they yeah, wait, paper chips. weights, just all they were. Yep. And, and it was funny, I was talking to one of them and they were telling me that as things came in, they would start salvaging from one, you know, a car out there it was missing one piece to put it into another one to get it going. Then they forgot what they were doing and they had, <laughs> you know, basically had a junkyard full of cars because they couldn't use parts in them. They couldn't figure out what was missing. So it, it, it was interesting, you know, that last couple of years in that industry. So I, I mentioned ESG, we've mentioned, you know, Forced Labor Prote Protection Act. Um, again, here's where uh, there's a lot of fines happening, a lot of um, a lot of things going on. If I don't know how much of your, you know, the audience brings it, uh, things in from China. I imagine a lot, because a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, companies do. With the Forced Labor Protection Act, you know, uh, customer, the Customs and Border Patrol, if they believe a shipment comes from an area that has forced labor, they can seize your goods at the border. And you have to prove to them that you didn't use that type of, uh, you know, support from a, a supplier like that to get your goods released. Um, so, you know, we're seeing, you know, this has happened. Um, there was a shipment of, um, back in actually in the COVID time, there was a shipment of gloves, right? We all needed PPE. There was a large shipment of gloves that got uh, grabbed at the border. And then after this, this you know, forced labor act was passed, it's actually gotten you know more critical. Um, if you can see some of the stats from June of uh, 2022 to March of 2023, over 3,000 shipments, 961 million dollars subject to review. And 420 of them, 424 were actually denied. Now there was over a thousand released, right? But that means that they they seized them, and those companies had to come in and prove. Now where are they getting their data? So CBP is getting. They've hired when they put this out. They hired a couple companies to provide them artificially intelligence based data on, you know, these areas, and so. That data is as good as public data is, right? When you're mining data from from automate, uh, from artificial intelligence, it can only get what's out there. It can't get verified data. So that's why having verified data of your supply chain is so critical. Yeah. And uh, Glenn, just for those of you who perhaps not have not uh, seen uh, the, you know, the initials ESG, that stands for uh, Environmental, Social and Governance. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Europe has been at the forefront of that for, for quite some time. And, and, you know, obviously they're ramping that up. And the United States is really starting to implement that as well. And so that's something that's going to be out there that uh, especially if you're an exporter, you're going to have to be aware that these countries are taking this stuff very seriously, that that their uh, clients, their customers are expecting, uh, you know, to make sure that there's no forced labor and that, you know, things are being done to protect the planet and whatnot. And so, you know, the world is definitely changing and we need to just kind of be aware that, that it is and that it's going to impact uh, our businesses and and to try to be as proactive as possible, so we we're not caught with uh you know fifty thousand dollars or something that we shipped to Germany or or you know uh, uh, France uh, only to find out that it can't come in, and that's where the problem actually starts. Yeah, and in, in you you what the the way they've structured these laws now, you can't play. Um, I don't. I didn't know. Oh no. <laughs> can't do that anymore. They expect you to know everything about your uh, supply chain, you know, where are you getting things from? So. Right. So next we want to talk a little bit about some uh, lessons learned and some tactics, you know, for, for helping mitigate. So when you talk about mitigating risks, right, there, there's a lot of different areas that you can be at. Obviously, to the right side of this charts, the better. <laughs> the wait and see approach, I think, was 
pre-COVID, people were doing that. And those who did that realized they had some problems. Um, people who are you know, relying on people is the next. And you can do that. Um, but it takes a lot more work, right? If you're relying on people and not technology, there, there's a hybrid approach that works best. And I think that's the key. But here's some, this is just some of the things that, you know, where you could be in this. And so you can, you can introspectively, you know, when you get these charts and or now, you know, say, where am I in this, in this continuum? Do yeah. I know what my supply chain looks like? Do I have systems that are monitoring? Um, do I have, you know, the ability to really understand what's going on and have developed, you know, workarounds? What's my playbook? for uh, resolving these things. Yeah. And, and ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to provide these slides to you so that you can uh, act, uh, use them as a, as a resource. And this one document here, I think, could, is a real gold mine in trying to ask yourself, I mean, so where, where are we? Where are we on this? Uh, and and as, as you answer some of those questions, you know, based on what you know, you'll, you'll have a very good idea of you know, where you're coming up short, where, where the gaps are and trying to mitigate your risk as much as possible. And just so everybody knows, there is no easy button, unfortunately. <laughs> we all wish there was that easy button that we could just push and everything would be done for us. It's not the case. Uh, we're not in that, not that far into the world yet. Like, uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, movies that we see that are way off in the future, uh, we don't have that that good of uh, information today. All right, so let's talk a little about the technology. And this is, you know, I, I, this is where how we get our data. Um, this is where you know the the types of data that we have on disruptions, uh, impacts, things like that. What it takes to do it, um, because you can. Uh, you can mine data yourselves. Uh, some people do, but it's very difficult. I think the question, you know, about were the factory fires in the U.S. only? Um, you, you really have to think about getting data from uh, many, many sources because what we see is we may have, you know, you talked about a factory fire. Um, if the the source we say, we get might say factory fire. It might say um, there was a smoke alarm. It might say a fire truck was, uh, you know, sent someplace. It might say, you know, burning. I mean, there's no telling what it'll say. And so our, you know, you have to build that natural language processing and really understand the events. And that's kind of how we look at it. Um, but it's key as you're doing this risk monitoring is, you know, do what you what you think is right for your size organization. You know, think about it, but definitely think about how you do it. You know, there are people who do Google alerts because you can get some information that way. There's different ways of doing it, but it is something that you, if you're not doing that sensing, you need to think about. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things that one has to analyze in terms of, you know, what tools do I need to use is, you know, how big, how big is the risk to your company? Uh, you know, if I don't know X, could it put me out of business? Uh, obviously, something that that the answer to that is yes, is, is pretty important. And you would want to put, uh, you know, resources into it to make sure that that if something goes wrong, that your company doesn't go uh, doesn't go away. Uh, obviously, if, if the impact is significantly less, well, you know, obviously you you can put uh, less resources on it. But uh, look at the uh, mitigating the risk and the level of risk uh, to to you and your company. Yeah, it, it it's interesting. Our company was founded. Our founder worked at Cisco. She worked at Flextronics and Cisco, but she was at Cisco. And they had a, there was a typhoon and they didn't find out till, you know, six weeks later that some sub tier site that they didn't know about was wiped out and it impacted their supply chain. And so they went to their CBI insurance company and said, Hey, you know, we've got, you know, $11 million of CBI insurance we're paying for. We, we want to, you know, put a claim in and it was denied. 
because it was a sub-tier that they didn't know about. They weren't named. They didn't have any information on them. And so they were like, well, that seems odd. What do we do? And that's when this whole idea of how do you really start investigating your supply chain and learning about it and learning where you know a part that you have is being manufactured two, three, four tiers down so that now you can name that site in your insurance. But it, what Cisco, because she was at Cisco, found out is they spent less than that $11 million for their insurance in building this program. And it made such a huge difference in them being able to be proactive in mitigating the risk. Yeah. And I think and you know, is understanding, as you said, understanding where your risks are and who are your riskiest suppliers. Absolutely. And a lot of times what will happen, uh, Glenn, is that, you know, I'll ask somebody like, well, so where do you get your stuff from? And they'll tell me, well, you know, it's Bob out of California. And that's that's all they know, right? It's, it's from Bob in California. They yeah. call Bob up and, and, and Bob sends them the stuff. But what they don't know is that Bob's getting, you know, uh, s some number of products from different countries all over the world. And, uh, you know, you're, you're at risk at, at several different levels. So at the, at the very least, trying to get a handle on where is my stuff really coming from? It's just critical. Yep. So that really drives to what we were just talking about, you know, how do you know, and that's really, you know, mapping your supply chain, right? So there, there's, Two ways to do it. One is the lowest effort way, which is AI driven. And I think I talked about that a little bit, but basically um, that gives you an idea of what your possible supply chain could be. Because if I was to, you know, if, if 3M was one of your vendors out there that you're buying things for, that you're turning around and then re-exporting it, if you went to and said, okay, with AI, give me all 3M sites. It would give you hundreds of sites. And then if you said, okay, who do they buy from? All of a sudden you can get into, you know, one supplier could turn into 60,000 different suppliers on the backside. So AI is great for giving you a, here's the directional impact of my supply chain. You know, I have a, a good idea of it. But then you have to get into what we call uh, contextualized or um, validated uh, mapping. And this is where you're actually going to your suppliers and saying, okay, tell me, you know, I, I'm buying this part XYZ from you. Tell me where it's being manufactured. If you're manufacturing, where it's being tested. Do you have an alternate site? And if you're buying it from somebody else or using a, a, a components, what's the bomb? And then who are those suppliers? Now, it sounds like, why would I do that if I was the supplier? You know, obviously with all of the regulations coming out there and the transparency that's being asked for, suppliers are getting, are used to this and they're willing to share. And you have to make sure they understand that you're, you're asking this information, not for trying to go around them, but just to understand your supply chain. Yeah. Um, and, and we see a lot of success in that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we have over 4 million parts now mapped in our, in our network, uh, you know, where they are all the way down to, um, you know, those parts mapped all the way down to the, the raw materials yeah. and where those come from. Yeah. In, uh, in, uh, of course, uh, uh, BOM, uh, it stands for bill of materials. Yeah. Bomb. Yeah. Bill of materials. Um, anything else. I think that's key here. Anything from your side? No, I think this is uh, very actionable. Uh, there's, it's kind of two pieces that you have to utilize to be able to maximize your your uh, efforts at getting at the information. It's not just one or the other, but there are two f two factors that if you utilize both of those, that's probably as good as it gets. Yeah, and I would tell you, the, the, guidance, the guidance we give okay. most Bye. customers here. So to get the whole thing from there, they got Excuse me, Chuck, uh, your mic's open. Is um, if, you're, if you have a, a small number of suppliers, you know, if you've got 25, 30 suppliers, you know, in that range, 
you don't really need any kind of tools to do this more than any more than an Excel spreadsheet because it's, it's manageable by your by your teams usually. And just have them work with their suppliers. And like I said, the key thing is making sure that supplier knows why you're doing it. Making sure they know that you're doing this because you're, you know, uh, because you want to make sure that you have plans in place, you know, and you know how to react when something goes on and that you're not trying to go around them. And that, that's the key to getting uh, people to, you know, work with you. Yeah. Hey, Glenn, uh, we, we had a, a, a question. Uh, it, if you're a small business, I mean, let's say, uh, you know, a 10, 15 uh, person business or even 25, you know, what, what are some, some means, some best practices for a company of that size that has limited human resources? What's, what's the, what are some of the best practices that you can talk about? Yeah. So, you know, the key there is the relationship. And if you're a small business, you know, it's all about relationships, right? And, and it's really the relationship that you can strike up with your suppliers. Um, it's, you know, making sure they understand why you're asking for data, you know, be very clear, be very open about it. Um, excuse me. Um, it, it's, you know, we have a list of best practices. They mostly fit for larger organizations, but a lot of them are even for the smaller ones. The, the more information you provide somebody who you're asking information from, the more likely they are to give you it. Yeah. So if, if you were going to your supplier and you said, I want information on where you, know, you make all my parts that I buy from you versus going to them and saying, hey, there's these five critical parts that I really need to understand where they're coming from. Which way are they going to lean, right? They're going to, the, because you asked for a limited set or you asked for, um, you gave them the part numbers that you were looking for versus asking them to supply it. Things like that are yeah. key. It just it just makes the relationship better, and, that, and it's all about relationships. It really point. is, uh, you know. And Glenn, to to your point, uh, a lot of times, what we we as business people we we treat our suppliers like well, almost like the enemy, right? Uh, you know, if if you're not if you're one cent higher, we're going to get rid of you. But what we really need to do, especially in today's world, is to treat them like partners. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, a cent or two. Uh, is is not going to be the difference between you making it and and uh, and breaking, uh, but not ha having this kind of information and not having a trusting relationship between partners is going to put you out of business. And so I I very strongly urge that you that you uh, you know change your mindset and talk to these people, develop a relationship, help them understand that that you guys are partners and that you're not going to get rid of them, that you're just trying to mitigate your risk and, and asking for their help uh, to, to do so. Yeah. We, we see a lot of uh, our customers will do things like, look, they go to their, their supplier their partner and they say, look, give me this data and I'll promise to order more from you. Right. You become my key supplier because you're providing transparency. Those who aren't providing transparency are getting less of my business. So now it becomes a win for them. Absolutely. All right. So then the case for supply chain risk management, that's what SCRM, I assume everybody knows that one, but supply chain risk management. What, you know, what is the ROI, right? Because that visibility, it does have a cost, right? Whether it's your small company and you have to invest people whether you're a larger company and you have to invest people and technology, you know, there is a cost to doing this. As I said, there's no easy button, but it also has a very, very high ROI. You know, these are some of the things we've seen out there in the industry. Uh, you know, if you didn't take action, right. Uh, and all of a sudden you had, you know, look at this first one, Ericsson had a $400 million revenue hit because they didn't take action that they should have. Right. What's the cost of making the wrong decision? What's the cost of making the right decision slowly? So the cost of delay, you know, you know sometimes, you know, we, we think things over so much that uh, we may have cost ourselves quite a bit. So if you're looking at, uh, you know, the cost of delay, sometimes that adding, you know, a month of delay may cost you so much that it's ridiculous. I, we, 
we had a um, one of our customers told us that uh, their if their line was shut down, it was a million dollars a minute. Yeah, especially like in the refinery business, in the petrochemical business, that's absolutely true. Yeah, so a million dollars a minute. So if you delayed and uh, on making a purchase or or deciding to you know start doing this and mapping and getting visibility, and there was an issue, think how much you could have mitigated it by having that data. And that's why we talk about that. Um, and what's the cost, obviously, of not having visibility? Yeah. Right. So, yep. you know, if you don't know how to move things around because there's something going on, you don't know where to go find an alternate supplier or where their alternate sites are. You know, you know, we talked about the visibility and I mentioned alternate sites. And why is that critical? And why is it critical then to be monitoring? So if if I have a supplier and I find out, OK, yes, they have a site where they're building everything for me. They have an alternate site that they can use. It may take them a week to stand it up or whatever the time is, but they have a site they can use. If I don't find out about a disruption until six weeks later, I guarantee their capacity to that alternate site has already been allocated to other customers of theirs who knew about it, who, were, who have that sensing and reached out to them. So you may not get the capacity even if they have that alternate site. Yeah, yeah and sometimes what, what I see, Glenn, is that uh, a company will make a decision to have only one company, even though there may be multiple possible suppliers, they'll use one company because they figure, well, if I give my entire production to X company, they're going to give me the best price. And, and uh, I mean, you know, volume, volume counts, no, no yeah. question about that. But once again, if that company, uh, if something happens, if they have a fire, if the guy retires, I mean, if they have a strike, if they can't get their materials, you know, that one or two pennies or whatever it is that, that you're going to save uh, by having all your all your production in one location. I mean, it's it's just not worth it. That, that's why having multiple suppliers is so, so important, uh, even though you're you're probably not going to get as good a price. You're you're uh, trying to uh, combat the possibility of you're going out of business because you you weren't able to get your your supplies versus paying just a little bit more and being able to switch from one supplier to uh, the other, uh, asking them to increase their capacity for on your behalf if if uh, one of the, one of the other suppliers that you normally use uh, goes down. Yeah, and, and I think. You know, there are situations, and we see this quite often. We, we, one of the things we do is give our customers their a risk profile of their products, of their you know the parts, of their suppliers, and, and you know, quite often we will see sole source um, happening. And it's key if you have a sole source supplier to really work with them to understand what is their business continuity plan, right? Do they have alternate sites where they can stand you up? So maybe if one site goes down, the second one can be stood up and what, it, like I said, the business continuity plans, that's key because if they're a sole source, you know, that should be part of being that sole source is that they're very transparent with you on how they operate. Yeah. Yeah. That, this is another point of, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, highlighting for you that, you know, if, if you hadn't thought about that, it's, we're, we're putting it on your radar. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that a, a circumstance under which, uh, it requires having a single source requires even more transparency than otherwise. Yeah. You know, we, another piece of this uh, ROI for having that, you know, supply chain risk management program built is, you know, looking at there are costs for risk, right? How much inventory do you need? Do you have to overstock because you're afraid that uh, something's going to happen? So, you, you know, you're carrying inventory. Um, you know, people working, how much do you pay for unexpected costs? One of the big things we saw um, with COVID is people buying, ex having to pay for expedited freight, right? So um, things started shipping on the airlines that used to be container ship. Uh, and so all that capacity started to be used up real quick. Plus the airlines had to reduce flights and that really caused some shortages. So, you know, you got to look at that and really understand your risk because of things like that. Um, there's some, by, obviously, financial benefits of reducing it, 
Um, that expediting freight can cost quite a bit. Um, you know, not having as much inventory, you know, things like that. Um, and insurance benefits. You know, there are insurance benefits of having visibility. As I mentioned, the CBI insurance, you know, sort of was the spark that started our company really uh, with, with Vindia. It, it, we talk, we work with our companies yearly on their CBI insurance because we're giving them visibility into named sites, multiple tiers down. So it may not be their supplier, but it's their supplier, supplier, supplier. And we know who that named site is. They can put that in their insurance, which gives you better coverage at a less price. So it can have some real benefits having visibility. Yeah, at, at um, the end of the day, I, I think it's about ass assessing what is the cost of failure? Yeah. You know, your, your company failing if it can't get some key component. Yeah. Is it, if, are you going to be lines down because of a capacitor, which is a simple little thing, right? We've seen it happen in the industry quite often. Yep. So if you look at that mapping and what it takes, there, there are, uh, you know, obviously the more effort, the higher the value. And that's kind of what this kind of shows you. So if you start thinking about doing these things, whether you do it with a company like ours or whether you do it on your own, which you can, it's really understanding. Well, the AI mapping you probably can't do on your own, but um, it, you really have to look at what is the benefit? What's my risk? How deep do I need to know? Do I need to know all parts and sub tiers and site business continuity plans? If so, it's going to take you more. You're going to have a lot more value, but it's going to take more time and more effort. So start at the lower end and start asking your suppliers just about their sites, right? Who are all your direct supplier sites? And then the next time you meet with them, you talk about, oh, well, who are your sub tiers? Who are you buying from? Right. And then you can start finding out which of your parts go to those. And so you can get value over time. And the, as the effort goes up, the value goes up. Now, this whole thing about reactive, aware, proactive, integrated, resilient, we, we actually use um, a, uh, a multi-tier maturity model to rank our customers. Uh, we help them with their uh, program. And that's really, they, most people start at being reactive, obviously. And that's just the continuum going up to resilient. So that's what that is. And with that, I am done with the slides. So if there are any questions, I'd love to open it up for more questions, if there are any. Let me uh, check to see here. What do you think here? Oh, OK. Uh, it, I just have a comment from Luis, my, my partner in uh, Portugal, uh, that he, the, some of the takeaways, some of the key takeaways was you have to assess your situation. You have to diversify to try to mitigate your, your risk and increase your chances of success and, and quite frankly, survival yes i think you know that 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 is key louise i think the key thing you know there visibility is what's going to allow you to do it yeah and uh lloyd brooks uh said the supplier visits uh is critical yeah if you can do it obviously that that works at your your first tier it's the, that second and third tier which is you know where you don't have a direct relationship right yeah and so hopefully the, the information that we provide to you, and once again, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be sending the slides to you. You know, Use it as a resource. Uh, look at the slides. I, we know that there was lots and lots of information and you couldn't grasp the whole thing uh, in one whack. But you know, look at that stuff and, and see, you know, where am I at? Ask your, your, yourself the question, where am I at in terms of uh, these, uh, these issues, these questions, and start formulate, formulating a plan to try to mitigate as much of a risk as possible. And uh, here at uh, Arkansas District Export Council, we're here to help you in any way we can. We have wonderful partners like Resilient and, and others that will, uh, you know, come, come on board if we need them to answer questions on the, the, that you might have out there. So feel free to, to contact us. I think that Ms. Heidi is going to have a, a slide kind of at the end that has our contact information. And as a matter of fact, uh, um, I don't see any other questions at this point, but if there is someone out there that does have a question, just unmute if you please would and, and go ahead and ask your question.
Okay, I'm not seeing anyone at this point. Well, very good. Uh, Heidi, if you'll go ahead and uh, move on to our, our slides, uh, the finishing slides, would really appreciate that. Okay, so there is uh, Glenn's uh, uh, contact information, both yep. his uh, uh, email and his phone number. He'll be very happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, you have uh, the District Export Council website uh, where you can get lots of information. And also we have uh, several of the uh, webinars that we've put on the uh, in the past on behalf of the uh, Arkansas Economic Development Commission and the Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions Department. Uh, you you see my uh, can you go ahead and go back just for a second, uh, Miss Heidi? Uh, you see uh, my uh, my email address as well as Jonathan, who's the chair, and Heidi, our our wizard behind the the curtain, so to speak. Uh, if you need to contact us, a, any one of us, uh, feel free to be able to do so. And uh, Heidi, if you'll give us that last slide. Oops. Oh, and and do that went blank. Okay. okay. Um, so, do you would you like to look at either one of these? Um, we don't have these quite up yet. Uh, the but we will have them up shortly, especially the the one on September thirteenth that will be yeah. up and go live. But if you will follow this um, page on Eventbrite, you will get notified and you can be one of the first to uh, sign up. Very good. Uh, do be aware that the Arkansas District Export Council puts on about 13, 14 classes a year on various uh, exporting, international business, and supply chain uh, related uh, topics. And so, you know, we're a really good source for for information uh, about those topics. At the end of the day, you know, our mission is to try to mitigate your risk uh, of, of exporting. And uh, we, we cover uh, every topic that is of even remote uh, importance in terms of doing so, of mitigating your risk, like today's uh, topic. And uh, so do kind of be aware that we're gonna be putting on, uh, you know, in the next couple of months, we're gonna be putting on these, uh, these uh, webinars uh, the Export Import Bank and SBA Resources, doing business in Canada, and then the uh, very important topic of ENCO terms. No, and I th yeah, central time. Uh, yes, uh, a, a central time, just like 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 it, it was today. Uh, Jonathan, do you have any la last minute words? No, I just want to say thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, and as it says right there, uh, we have a YouTube channel. So if you know, anything yeah. got lost or you want to go back and, and review it. It's a archive of all of the classes that we have put on. Um, so please use that as a resource as well. And if you have any questions on those, reach out to us. Um, thank all you all that. for taking time out of your schedule to join us. Thank you to our sponsors being the Arkansas Economic Development Commission and Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions. Uh, we're here for any of you that need us, and uh, well, I hope to hear from you all soon. Thank you thank all. Thank you again. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, uh, Glenn. And thanks so much for taking time to to come to our webinar and hope that you found it uh, uh, informative. You guys have a